Hi, and welcome to The Forecast. I'm Alex Helmbrecht, and I'm joined here with my co-host, Daniel Binkert. Our guest today is Dr. Matt Evertson, the professor, a professor, not the professor, a professor and department the chair. He's the professor. <laughs> yeah, the, the OG professer. <laughs> well, you are in the English department. I, I was Getting say, there for sure. <laughs> I was going to say he is a professor, and as an English teacher, he'll probably uh, critique my use of the definitive article there, but no. that's okay. Uh, he, uh, professor and department chair of, of English, and then there's uh, justice studies, social sciences. It's kind of a, a long uh, department. Chair, but but basically, Matt, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So, as we've alluded to, uh, you've been at CSC for a while. Talk about how long you've been here, and, and what are some of the changes that you've seen within your department? Oh, Lord. Well, I came in 2001, and I remember that vividly because we had been in school for maybe a month, and then 9-11 happened. Um, and, but that was not, you know, a uh, 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 any predictor of my my my, <laughs> my work here at Shaver State College, um, but uh, yeah. So I started in 2001, and the changes since 2001. Everybody I came in who were sort of running the program then have all retired, or gone on to other things, or passed away. So we had uh, Dorset Gray's was still teaching at that point in time a little bit. Um, George Griffith I think was a senior faculty member. Um, Kathy Barr, uh, I was working with her pretty closely when I first came in, um, and Bob McEwen, and uh, who am I forgetting? A couple of other f folks. Uh, Mike Cartwright. Mike Cartwright. Cartwright. Um, sadly, you know, just a year or two after he retired, he passed away. All of these people had a really huge impact on on sort of my mentorship, uh, mentoring me and my growth at Shatter State College, and they're all gone now. Um, but we started to sort of, I don't know if evolve is the right word, but every time you have a new influx of new faculty members, newly minted PhDs or whatever, you start to sort of influence the program, and we're seeing that right now, um, since most of that uh, more seasoned stock has gone on to other places. Um, we have younger, more diverse faculty now. Um, and I think our, our one of the things, remember, we all know George Griffith, but George was kind of a, he, his famous phrase was get in the traces and pull. So he was kind of a no nonsense, let's just get her done sort of stuff and not rock the boat. And so my second or third year as a, as a permanent faculty member in the program, um, we came up for catalog changes and it had always been kind of just pro forma for several years. I just like rubber stamp it again. And I said, well, let's take a look at this catalog and let's start pulling things apart. And one of the things that we had seen on some of the surveys that the students did when they graduated was they wanted more courses. And we were always like, where do you think you're at? UNL or something where we have all these professors and all this capacity to teach a lot of different courses. Um, but we worked out a program to try and bring in all these elective courses and set up more sort of guided choice for the students. So rather than us telling them take this class, they, they could choose from a bucket of classes. And we had a huge conversation as, as a department whittling these down. Everybody had these sort of literature and war, literature and, and food. George was big on literature and food. And so we pared it down to, I think, these six, six courses, which were kind of the new courses that first new courses have been introduced in a long time. And this kind of gets us to where we're at, evolving, if that's the word, today. So there was an emphasis on literature, the environment, a class on gender, a class on contemporary writers, um, a class on philosophy and literature, literature not of the West at the time, but we called it the Great Plains, literature of the Great Plains, because we really wanted a regional focus. And then we had a class called Literature Across Borders, which was going to be exploring how different people move across borders and, and landscapes with an emphasis on sort of multi-ethnic literature. And now that has become our multi-ethnic literature class. So the seeds of those courses were started then. And George was right. We had a lot of trouble filling those courses at first and predicting how to schedule. It's still a problem to this day, but they did take hold so that was a major change. And I think now we have a new catalog coming out in the fall where it's kind of got that principle embedded in it, tracks or paths that the students, maybe not as Wild West or 
open-ended as we had when George first predicted we'd have some trouble with that. So there's little narrow tracks and paths that students can go through. Um, and one of those we introduced a couple years ago was an emphasis on diversity studies. Um, so students now have to take at least one course in that arena. And now in this new catalog, we're going to have this emphasis on regional studies. So that will include environmental literature, Native American literature, and, and literature of the American West is the, the way we call the course now. So those are pretty big changes that happen to the program, um, just in English. Um, but changes that make sense. I mean, they, yeah. they fall directly in line with, with the college's mission. Right, right, right. The other major thing that's that's evolved, well, the mission being frontier and remote and all that sort of, so that's true. A lot of that came out as we were trying to sort of embrace the notion of what is unique about Shatter State College. And at that time, we were thinking, you know, this this idea that there's the environment all around us and students can get out and do all these sort of interesting things. Um, and we do, we do have really amazing faculty, particularly in the humanities and the arts, because of the glut of PhDs and everything on the market. <laughs> and so you can get a really great ex education um, at Shatter State College, you know, that cliche about the hidden gem. I think it's kind of true um, for the English department, I think especially, because we have people that are bringing all sorts of expertise in very interesting esoteric areas, and they bring them to our little, little area. And, and so... I think that that has been, that's evolving now with our new faculty that we've sort of, uh, what's the word, reloaded? We've reloaded. Um, the other thing was the evolution of the creative writing program. Um, and that's, that's a story that's continuing right now, you know. The new catalog has space in there for students for the first time in a major or a comprehensive major to emphasize or focus on creative writing. We've only had the minor up till now. But that program has grown a lot. <laughs> yeah, That's I, good. as a as a graduate of the CSC English program, I, I wish that that track would have been there when, when I was a student. Um, this may sound like a dumb question, but but when I was a student, and probably when Daniel was a student as well, you could take courses as writing intensive. How how is that different from creative writing? Writing intensive. So what was that like? Like you took it in uh, in a particular field or particular? no? I think it was. Um, well, maybe it wasn't even here. I kind of jumbled, <laughs> I jumbled my colleges together because I also went to McCook Community College. Right, but I know right. that I could take, I took English literature and it was writing intensive. Yeah. So basically it meant I had yeah. to write one additional paper, I Right, believe. right. And, you know, there, there are certain um, programs, and we had talked about this at one time. Um, you have a composition program where, like, we service the rest of the institution. So most of the students who take have to take a writing course when they come to college, they'll come through our program, whether they're English majors or not. And in some places, there'll be a literature, that'll be a literature class. So they'll write, instead of about writing about, uh, you know, cause and effect or a position paper, they'll do a literature, s series of literature papers. Um, the creative writing program as, well, I can tell you the story about it at Shatter State College. Um, we had this really great poet on on our faculty here, Bob McEwen, R. F. McEwen, and he was he was kind of a divisive professor. Students who who loved his approach to teaching poetry loved it, and people who didn't like it didn't like it. And so he had sort of champions, and he had detractors. Um, but his methods really seemed to work. But it, it only sort of worked for a small set of students who could kind of get his vibe because he was a very formalist poet in the way he taught, and then he said you could break those rules later on and do free verse. But most students want to come in and do, you know, performance poetry and free verse and that sort of stuff. And so while we asked Bob, let's, let's, let's try and expand this. I think this creative writing stuff's taking off, a lot of other institutions. Um, so we had one class at that time in creative writing. Um, and what we did was we divided the class into an A, B, and C, and we put them in rotation. And I can't remember what, what it was, but one was fiction, one was nonfiction, and one was poetry. And Bob would continue to do the poetry class. And then I started teaching the fiction class. I'd had some fiction training in college, but I'm not a creative writing professor. Um, and then Lee Miller and a couple of other people were doing the creative nonfiction, right? Then George Griffith retired. And we I was chair of the program at the time. And I said, what if we hire, instead of another literature person, let's hire someone as a full-time creative writer. 
And that's what we did. We put out a search at that time. We had to get the program, had to agree to it. And, um, and that was our first hire, and that was Steve Coughlin. And he came in, and he said, you got to have a lot more creative. So I said, you're never going to get students to take these classes. You know, we've been trying for years. And, but he set it up. He built the field, and they came, so to speak. Um, they, the, the program became much more like other creative writing programs with a multi-genre course early on where you get to try poetry, and you get to try fiction, and you get to try playwriting and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then the advanced courses that we see now. And now in the new catalog, you know, it's grown so much that we have a, now they're intermediate. The advanced courses are now intermediate courses, and we're going to have more advanced courses. So it's really been amazing how that program has taken off. And the, the creative, I mean, in some institutions, creative writing would be over in Memorial Hall, you know, be over with the arts. And so they, it's integrated with us in literature and in English studies, and that's the the term we're using for our new major and comprehensive major, English studies, right? So you have capacity for doing more philosophy and humanity sort of stuff. You have capacity to do more literature and you have capacity to do creative writing. So the so you do see how that's a lane though mm -hmm. that is whatever creative means, yeah. Yeah. it's different than reading some esoteric literature and writing scholarly papers about it versus I guess art, crafting art things like that. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of changes in 20 years. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. Well, that's great. Uh, so, Matt, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, where'd you grow up? Uh, what's your um, educational background? Where do you guys think I grew up? You were talking about accents earlier. Oh, yeah, we were. <laughs> I couldn't say. Kimball. How did you know that? <laughs> you knew that. <laughs> there, I, know, I know your older brother. <laughs> there's lots of Kimballs in, in this, your younger in this brother, country. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I grew up in Kimball, Nebraska, and for years teaching at Shatter State College, I've always said that kind of like, mm -hmm. because, you know, they tell you when you go to graduate school, you know, I, I'll, I won't, don't, you know, don't defecate where you sleep, don't, you know, mess up your own nest, right? Um, get your degree somewhere and then go somewhere else, right? And so, um, I don't know, I always kind of had a love-hate relationship with Nebraska, um, Kimball, Nebraska, I don't want to diss on Kimball, Nebraska. It was a lovely place to grow up. But I really wanted to get out of there by the time I was in, uh, at finishing high school. So I went to the eastern end of the state, went to UNL, and um, I really enjoyed school there. But I, got to, I grew kind of tired of that Lincoln area, and I don't know, far, um, corn country? I don't know. Um, and so uh, I was hoping to go maybe to the east coast or something and, you know, it's very competitive to get into graduate school. So uh, I had limited options when I was accepted to a few schools, and I went down to Arizona State University where I did my PhD. Um, and so uh, I don't know. I, I always thought, like, I would finish my PhD, and if I was able to get a job teaching, it would be Boston or New York City or pro actually probably something on the West Coast. I don't know. Um, and then I saw this job opening for a one-year position here at Shadron. And I was like, because we were told at the time, you'll never get a job. In fact, I was president of the Graduate Scholars of English Association at Arizona State. That sounds like a flex. It's not. But we, one of the things we did was we set up a lot of professional development seminars where we did mock interviews and stuff. To, and it was just like, nobody's getting jobs. So I applied for lots of positions, um, like everybody was when I was just working on my dissertation. I was ABD. And um, I sent, I said, Shadron, I think that's kind of where I grew up. Um, I know I wrestled in that gym up there one time. <laughs> um, I played football on there. I think they kicked our butt on the field up there. Um, so, uh, so I sent an application off and then didn't think anything of it. And I've come to learn this is kind of the Shadron way, Frontier and Remote. They didn't get back to me until several months later in the summer. And like, I'm getting ready to start my fall semester at ASU. I got a new teaching gig and everything, and they're like, we'd like to interview you for, I'm like, no way, I'm not going to do this. I'm getting ready. I've got a house here. i got kids. And they, uh, it was Dean Tucker who was on the phone, and he says, well, I have to tell you, we're probably going to hire you. And I was like, <laughs> so I talked to my dissertation director. Isn't this a great story about how you, this, they, they, th okay, 
we have searches now for faculty in our program and there, hundreds of people apply. So don't, don't get the wrong impression here. But for me, back in the day, I kind of stumbled into this position up here. Um, I came up and interviewed and did all that. It's for a one-year position. Um, but my dissertation advisor at the time, he said, get your foot in the door. Okay? So I did it. And they hired me. And then right, right away, the person that was teaching American literature, um, he decided he didn't want to teach here any longer. Um, there was a hiring freeze that year. I don't remember if you guys remember. That was 2002. There was mm -hmm. a budget crunch. And so they couldn't fill the position right away. And so I got to have a year teaching Scott's classes after he left, all the American lit all the stuff I'd been trained for. So it was great. It was really great. Um, and then I was kind of a shoe-in for the permanent position when it opened. And that's how I stumbled into my position at Shatter State College. Um, but I think in the first several years, I did kind of have this, uh, I'm from Nebraska. Because you want to be from, you want to bring stuff in from outside this world to teach our students about the w big world out there. I wanted to get out of Nebraska. I hope that some of our uh, students want to get out into the bigger, wider world, you know. So I always kind of had an inferior inferiority complex about that. But I, I learned to get over that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of ties into how I, I came to think about teaching more of the regional stuff. Yeah, you know, I, that's interesting. I, I feel like uh, once you kind of accept it, um, it becomes a lot more peaceful. <laughs> yes. The, the phrase we used at the time, and I don't think it's negative at all, but it's the old Stephen Stills song, love the one you're with. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. And I think that not only, it's not like you're settling, you're saying, okay, Shadron is a unique place. It really is. Mm -hmm. It has unique things to offer. So I recognized this when I first came because, okay, I come for a one-year position and Kathy Barr's like, we just hired an American lit guy. What are you doing here? And, you know, you know, this is going to be hard for, we, did, we, we don't have enough capacity. And I was like, oh boy, I just sold my house in Arizona and all this other sort of stuff. But then I saw the Sandoz Center. They were constructing it. We got to go over there and like tour it and everything while they were doing all. I'm like, who is the Sandoz? I grew up in Nebraska. I grew up in Western Nebraska. My mom used to talk about old jewels. I never knew what she was talking about. She took us on trips into the sand hills and stuff. I always hated it. <laughs> Let's go home, you know? Um, and so it was just, so, but okay, they're clearly renovating a building. What's going on here? So I found out more about the society and I got involved with the society. And then I started reading Sandoz. And then when I came on as a permanent faculty member, I started teaching Sandoz, even though I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, started using her work in Native American literature. I started to, I offered a course in our intro to literature class that everybody kind of teaches. Every once in a while I'd throw in a section that was labeled Nebraska Land Writers um, and would use those writers to sort of represent the genre. So we'd read some Ted Couser for poetry and we'd read Rilla Cather, we'd read Sandoz. And so I just started getting more and more engaged with the regional aspect. Mm -hmm. and. And, you know, I knew of it, but I didn't really know that much about it. Um, and, you know, I tell people all the time, Sandoz to me is an uneven writer, and some of her stuff I think is not as effective as, but I just love her, her way of thinking, the, the way she was future thinking, far-sighted, prescient. I think now I'm trying to explore Sandoz from an environmental angle. I think she said a lot you know, a long time ago that sort of comes up as very sort of contemporary in the way she thought about the environment uh, and things like that um, and the settlement of the region. So I just kind of became fascinated with with Sandoz and then joined the society and then they had money uh, from some of these endowments and, and let's spend the money. Now let's start doing the writing workshop. And so I fell in love or I, I I guess I could say I, I fell in love with Nebraska. And also, this part of Nebraska is so different than all other parts of mm -hmm. Nebraska, you know. Uh, I don't know why I didn't know that when I was a kid, that there was this this oasis up here with these pine trees and everything. We'd come up here on, on trips for sports and things like that in Shadron, and I just I don't remember ever seeing a pine tree. <laughs> I don't remember the forests. 
I guess I would say I was, had my head in my phone at the time, but we didn't have phones back then. Maybe the uh, Game Boy. My little, they didn't have Game Boys. <laughs> we had the little sort of Coleco football or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember those. Those games were fun. Um, so, Matt, you've been, as you mentioned, you've been heavily involved with the Sando Society and the uh, Story Catcher writing workshop. Tell us a little bit about Story Catcher, and I believe it recently celebrated its 10th year. It did. So I got some some handouts here so I can refresh my memory. We're working on a report right now on the 10-year anniversary, birthday of, of Story Catcher. Um, and I don't have the, it's, there's so much stuff to c compile after it's 10 years. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You guys have been Definitely. running on this. Yeah, I'm trying to make a flashy report and sort of, um, but so this is the, the introduction of the report is Story Catcher by the Numbers. Um, so in 10 years, we've had, I did the math the last couple of days, 111 story catchers. So we've had 111 people enroll for our various workshops over the 10 years. And tw at least 25 of these people have come back again and again. They've been repeat sort of customers, so to speak. Um, I think of that 111, so you think about the composition of people who've come to the writing workshop over the years. Um, it's been a mixture of sort of older people who are interested in doing their memoirs and telling their stories, and they like Mari Sandoz maybe, and younger writers that we kind of maybe had to encourage with scholarships and strong arm a little bit and get them involved. And now it has shifted so that the last couple years we've had, I'd say we would skew more towards students and probably more towards serious creative writing students who are either doing undergraduate or graduate level creative writing. Um, but 30 of those 111 participants over the last 10 years have been CSC students, so students that we recruited, um, and many of them got scholarships. Um, and these are the states represented in our enrollment so far. We had 63 participants from Nebraska, or at least they claimed Nebraska as their residence at the time, 16 from South Dakota, 11 from Colorado, 9 from Wyoming, 2 with, from Wisconsin, 2 from Alaska, and then we've had people come from California, Kansas, Kentucky, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Missouri, Oregon, and even the United Kingdom. Alan Wilkinson came one year and, and sat in on a lot of the sessions, and he's from, he's from England. Um, over that same period of time, we've brought in, and with the funding from the Raleigh and Esther Pilster Foundation through the Sando Society, they've been extremely generous. Um, they've paid out over 10 years, the uh, workshop has, uh, has cost, or the cost of, of staging it over 10 years, is about $92,470. That's an estimate, because I don't know how good my math is. But, um, <laughs> and of that, about 61, almost $62,000 of that has been direct grants from the Sando Society to fund it. Um, and then from Shadron State College and the English Department, about almost $4,000 has gone in over the 10 years. And the remainder has been from what people pay when they register. Um, and in that period of time, that money has allowed us to bring in 32 ins writing instructors. And I have to tell you, every time we invite people to come and be a part of the, the story catcher, we try to approach fairly big names, you know, people that are heads of creative writing programs, people that are publishing. Um, and, you know, I say, take a look at our website and look at our past, our archive of past um, workshops. It's at storycatcherworkshop.org. Um, and they are amazed at the type of talent we've been able to attract um, to come and lead these workshop sessions. So I invite everybody to go online and check that out. Take my word for it. These are uh, really important voices in the field. Um, and so that's really been sort of the heart of, of the writing workshop over those 10 years, the, the funding and the ability. And then the other thing is, I, I think one of the stories over 10 years is how it's maybe changed and evolved. You guys want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, tell us about that. Uh, well, so we started out on campus, because I'm only for, through the first two workshops in my report that I'm putting together. We started out on campus, um, and uh, we had Tom and Laura McNeil. Now, Tom McNeil is probably most famous in our area for writing the novel Goodnight Nebraska. Um, 
but he he's a California guy who spent his summers in Nebraska, and then he wrote quite a, he wrote that parlayed that into several novels, and so he was a big get for us. And we said, but you know, he 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 grew up or he spent time in this area, particularly over near Hemingford, um, or Hay Springs actually, um, and so that's where Good Night Nebraska is set, by the way. Um, so we got him to come for the first one to be a keynote speaker, and then his his wife was writing, she had a, a National Book Award nominee in young adult fiction, which you know is hugely popular mm -hmm. right now. So, well, how about we bring my, so we got those, so we had these two really prominent writers. I mean, they're publishing with Random House, big, big presses, right? And so we got them to come and be the keynote speakers, pretty cheap actually. Um, and then we paid um, several people from the region to come in and be our workshop leaders. Um, and they did actual workshop where you sit around a table and you have you guys ever done that where you you print off a a, a story and everything and people tear it apart and they read it before mm -hmm. and they come in with all this critique so that's how we envisioned doing the workshop at first we had i'm so naive now that i think about it. we had we started out with five different sessions we thought we were going to have enough people because you'd have to put like five or six people in each session right we have five or six instructors we were going to contract to do this. And I think that first year we maybe had, we finally wound up with maybe 20 people enrolling. And at the time I thought that was terrible. I've come to see that that's kind of the virtue of our, our writing workshop. It's a small community. Um, and they're all doing this really intense workshopping. And then um, it was just not really, they, they had to choose an, one instructor over another. People didn't like doing that. So we learned from the evaluations. We learned from what we were doing. We did it all at Shatter State College over in the Sandoz Center. We thought it was important to get the Sandoz story out. Okay, so the next year we do a little bit less of the concurrent sessions, and now we're kind of marching people through similar talks and things like that. We dialed back on the hands-on workshop, and then eventually we're to the place now where if you want that hands-on workshop where you do the stuff beforehand and you bring in more seasoned work, you have to sign up for our advanced workshop. Otherwise, almost all of our sessions in Story Catcher are, are what we call generative. So the people come out, they, now they're coming out to places like Fort Robinson or Shatter State Park. They're being inspired by the environment and the instructors and the setting, and we're trying to generate more writing. So that's kind of been how it's evolved. We, we kind, of, kind of like with our English program here, you know, you can't always compete with the more established writing workshops where they can really pay instructors to sit and go through every line of your writing. Now we've made it more sort of this community where we try and support creativity. Um, and we've moved towards having these retreats. So we started seeing this um, early on. We'd stay mostly on Shatter State College campus. People would stay in the dorms. Then we started having field trips. We went out to Fort Robinson one year for one day um, to do some hiking and some other things. We went to Camp Norweska one year, and we didn't spend the night, but we had, this was the year that Steve Coffin joined the fac uh, faculty, I think. We had events out there at their facilities, and they were like, hmm, let's start doing an actual retreat. So then we booked the, this was the, how it evolved. It got much more expensive every year, much more planning. We booked Fort Robinson, we had that for two years in a row, and then we are going to do our third year, and COVID got in the way. And then this last year, we did it at Shatter State Park. So it's moved completely into this retreat model where we're sort of nurturing, fostering writers and their creativity. We have some of the hands-on, one-on-one sort of workshopping, but it's mostly these generative sessions, craft talks, a lot of sharing out, um, and on-the-spot feedback and that sort of thing. So that's how the workshop has really evolved. The, the community model, maybe 20 people is what we can accommodate. We try not to do too many concurrent sessions now. Everybody kind of moves together as a group. So that's how that's sort of evolved. Um, and next year, uh, it's going to go on the road to Gunnison, Colorado. So we've kind of not severed, but we're not so bound to this campus anymore. Um, I think uh, it is. It will become the Story Catcher Roadshow, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think after Gunnison, we could maybe go, who knows? If we can make it work in Gunnison, we'd come back to Shadron, maybe go up to Estes Park and use the YMCA facilities up there. I was at a conference up there. That was great. 
We go to eastern Nebraska. Where do you guys think we should take it? Well, I, sky's the limit, really. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think there's even, you know, the Scotts Bluff gearing area, there, yeah, there would sure. be opportunities there. Um, as far as western Nebraska, I think some place in Wyoming would be great. Um, I'm you just saying that. Laramie? Yeah, I went, yeah. I was a participant in the 2018 Story Catcher, and uh, it was a really fulfilling experience. So if anyone's ever on the, if they're on kind of, Leaning one way or the other about doing this, uh, I would highly recommend it. It's, yeah. it's a really rewarding, creative experience. But um, the faculty, the year I attended, were all from Wyoming. So maybe yeah. that would be a nice way to maybe yeah. involve all those, those right. folks again. So, right. Yeah, right. I think you have a lot of opportunity with yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, we have funding and we have kind of a history now and the, we have sort of a model that seems to work. Um, people keep coming back. I really like the idea of making it more available. And, you know, last year we did it virtually. That worked really well, too. So I don't know. We're excited about the prospects going forward um, and, and what the future might hold for it. Yeah, that, we'll be excited to see where that goes. Um, can you tell us some of the highlights over the past 10 years? Well, I was just thinking about, so I was, I, was, was Dan O'Brien there the year that you no, it was H.L. Hicks. Okay, it was the uh, Wyoming faculty. Jeffrey Lockwood, uh, and I cannot, Nina maybe? Yeah, Nina McConaughey. Yeah. Um, okay, so the highlights to me come back to this sort of notion of regionalism, um, which is kind of my bag here at Shatter State College. Um, so Dan O'Brien, who, who wrote, he's written a lot of interesting stuff about bison, and he's, he's written some interesting novels. Stolen Horses is the novel that's sort of set in the South Dakota area. Um, and but he wrote these historical novels that are set at Fort Robinson, the the contract surgeon, and oh, I forget the name of the other one. Was it the Indian agent or something like that? Um, and we had him. He was our guest the first year out at Fort Robinson. He brought bison meat because he has this company where they sustainably raise bison. It's Wild Idea, and he wrote a book about it called Wild Idea. So he's out there grilling the bison with this, you know, thing. And I got a great picture of him with the smoke coming up. And he, he, and he, he, he donated the, the food, you know, to kind of promote his company and things like that. And then he goes in. We have our bison burgers and everything. And then we go in and we sit in the living room and we're looking out the window at the parade grounds where he reads a passage from the Indian agent about, I think it was from the Indian agent, when they, uh, when they bring um, Crazy Horse in. And he reads elements of that. And that's just the sort of thing that just makes me have chills. Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. Because <laughs> it's, it's that element of art captures the truth of that moment, maybe more than even historic photographs and, and uh, historical recounts or whatever. Um, and just also being there and having that sense of history. I was doing this report too, and I, I forgot about this, but the first year, this is kind of the way we thought about Storycatcher. Um, we want to celebrate the region. So the first year we had this field trip. Um, we had our, our hands-on intensive uh, sessions in the morning, and in the afternoon we had these field trips. And uh, we took a group of the participants out to the Beaver Valley area. We went over to the Spotted Tail Agency where there's just a historic marker mm -hmm. and all this. And, and we read, the parts from Mari Sandoz's book on Crazy Horse, where he's there trying to get sort of refuge so they won't bring him in. You know, we're reading those passages, and then we go, um, we go to the Spotted Tail Agency. We go, we we follow the 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 road back into Shadron, the dirt road there that roughly parallels that ride of Crazy Horse. Um, and then the next day, we picked up the journey to Fort Robinson. Um, and read from the passages on Crazy Horse and the passages from Cheyenne Autumn about the Cheyenne Breakout, and they have historical interpretations out there, you know. So I love the way that that sort of blends place, history, you know, all that sort of stuff. That's really been a great opportunity. All the hikes we've done. Yeah, so it's interesting. I'm more interested in <laughs> the activities than the writing <laughs> sessions. I think we have had really good writing sessions out there, too, and really amazing speakers. But And this last year, the so the cohort that you had was the University of Wyoming faculty, so that was kind of the theme that year. Um, and I think our theme was frontier and remote, maybe. I think even. it was, yeah. yeah. And then this last year, we didn't really have a theme, but most of the writers are very much in the environmental space. So we had Derek Sheffield, who is 
uh, the poetry editor for Terrain.org, which is probably the leading online environmental journal. Um, we had Laura Pritchett, who's, who's written a lot about environmental, and she heads the nature writing program, at, uh, MFA program at Western Colorado University. Allison Hagees from University of Wyoming. Her, her writing has a lot to do with place and environment. So this last year, the, it seemed like there was kind of an environmental theme that was, was taking place. So I really love how those sort of things develop. Each year is a little bit different. So those to me are sort of the highlights how each year we do something. We try something a little bit different each year. Um, I'd say pulling it off the first year at Fort Robinson was a huge highlight. Surviving the tornado the last time we were out there, right. that was a pretty big highlight. The, the fun thing is always seeing the writers come together, you know, the community developing, basically. Sure. Well, that's what I was going to mention. That's the best part of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, you kind of go into a workshop situation thinking there might be some animosity or, or some, I don't know, feelings of, of inadequacy or, or whatever. Um, there's none of that. It was right. such a positive environment. And there, I still talk to some of the writers that I, I met three Absolutely. years ago. And um, it was just a really great experience, a nice community. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of funny if you ever go, you just see Matt running around for three <laughs> days straight. There's a lot of logistics that he didn't mention any of those, but there, there is a lot going on. <laughs> I like that stuff, though. I mean, that w w you guys old enough for, to remember the A-Team? Yeah, oh, of yeah. course. Yeah, Mr. T. I love it when a plan comes together. I really do love it when a plan comes together. Seeing it come together is always very satisfying to me. Sure. And then I get to meet all these great writers, and they sign their books for me and stuff like that. I don't have any of the pressure of having to perform <laughs> or share my own writing, um, that sort of thing. So those are the highlights, uh, the, the people, I think the community that we've been able to develop, yeah. I like to hear that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Matt, what are some things you enjoy outside of work? I would imagine hiking is, is one of them. I become much more of a, a stay on the, the well-groomed trail kind of outdoors <laughs> person. We used to like backpacking quite a bit, and I've just gotten to where I can't handle sleeping on the ground. So we got a little travel trailer now, and so we've been, you know, doing more of that sort of camping and then... Um, so yeah, I love being in the outdoors. Um, we moved outside of town several years ago, and so I just like being in trees and in nature. Um, but that involves a lot of uh, what my wife calls tractor stuff. We don't have a tractor, <laughs> but you know, where were you all day? I was out, you know, cutting brush or just making stuff up to not have to grade papers or something like that. You know? <laughs> um, that's pretty much. And then I. I I've become a, a, a very adept poultry farmer. Um, if <laughs> now, has uh, uh, Teresa Frank helped you in that yes. aspect of your life? I say I'm adept at poultry farming. Uh, um, the concept that I implemented, the, so I, it's true, I, I teach a class with Teresa Frank over in Rangeland Studies called Home on the Range, and we combine our worlds. Um, so I, I come from the humanities and the literature, and there is some literature about chickens. Um, but we usually do a theme book, and, and so one year we did, you know, a, an animal that you can explore from all its cultural variants, from biology to art to its cultural impact to food and all that sort of stuff. So one year we did chickens, and we raised chickens during the course of the course, and the students got to hatch them out. And they were Teresa's chickens. She was living in town at the time. Um, and she gave me some chickens. So, you know, in-town chickens is kind of a thing right now. I see yeah, lots of yeah. people in town with chickens. Yeah, certainly. Um, so we started out, so I don't know how many you can have in town. I think we had four. And then when we moved outside of town, so now I have about almost 30 chickens. Wow. That is a, what, what is a, a group of chickens called? A flock. Oh, I was going to say a cluster. <laughs> a cluster. It's definitely a cluster. But, um, so, but the, the chickens are in my little pasture area that has trees, so we, we, call, it, uh, we call it tree range. Tree range Good. chickens. So they're free range. And we do get the eggs, and, you know, um, I'm actually raising some birds to harvest in the fall for the first time. That's why I have more than I, I normally would. So this, I, I pretend to be a vegetarian a lot of the times, but I, I will eat chicken, and especially if it, it is something I've raised. You know, I really like that idea of being sustainable. 
and knowing where your food comes from. So you so, don't name the chickens. I don't name. I have stopped naming the chickens. <laughs> but I have a nice little flock that I've been raising that we're going to try and harvest. Maybe we'll do that as part of Home on the Range. I don't know. Um, I like that idea of, of sort of that's where my work has gone too. You know, of late has been this e- ecological focus, and so I'm I'm doing that when I do my sabbatical in the in the in the spring, um, and I like this idea of not being too romanticized about nature or being, you know, too woke about it in some ways. Like I think we have to be honest about our incisors in our mouths, and we are omnivores and. And uh, I think we should eat less meat to be sustainable for the planet and for our own health. But I also think we have to be realistic about the fact that we are part of an ecosystem. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and so I like that idea of as an experiment. That's kind of the way I sort of think of doing things. So raise the chickens, you know, take care of the eggs. Well, there's too many eggs. I don't, we don't know what to do with our eggs. So, um, And then uh, let's see if it's possible to maybe, I don't know, will I be able to? Butcher those chickens, do you think? Alex? Uh, I think so. <laughs> I mean, you, 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 you didn't say I'm going, to, I'm going to kill the chickens. You said I'm going to harvest well, the I'm chickens. Well, I'm trying to so use the euphemism <laughs> to be more in keeping. I th- well, I think, I think you did a nice job. I think mentally you're there. You've, yes. separated, yeah. you've separated the action um, yeah. from maybe the emotion. I think not giving them names helps. I remember <laughs> seeing something. It was, um, you know... Uh, uh, some YouTube video. Is, it was a question of what's a good pet to give me for my kid. Well, get yeah. him a chicken. Yeah, and they make good pets, and if it doesn't work out, uh, you can yeah, eat dinner. <laughs> but <that's good. laughs> when I I was thinking of the the old Simpsons episode where Homer has a pet lobster. Oh, that was a yeah. great one. And he takes a bath with it, yep. and, he, and then he has he's crying while he's eating. Crying it. while he eats it. <laughs> I definitely had that sort of relationship with the food we raise. Now, have you ever experimented with the eggs? Because I saw this documentary about food on mm-hmm. Netflix where it basically stated chickens will eat anything. Yes. And, and they, they eat ticks. Yeah. For pest control. Yes. And they like spicy things. So yeah. this chef who runs this farm to, very expensive farm-to-table restaurant where right. they have like micro carrots and all these other yeah. things, um, feeds chickens nothing but serrano peppers. <laughs> and um, the chicken's egg yolk comes out red. Really? Is it so, spicy? He said it's kind of spicy. Yeah. It's, it's a Chef's Table documentary on yeah. Netflix. So um, I can't remember the name of the restaurant. It's in uh-huh. Massachusetts, I think. But yeah. maybe that's an experiment that you and Teresa can do in that class because it'd be a multidisciplinary approach. Maybe bring in some FCS that's nutritional true. stuff it's to true. it. It's spicy it's true. chicken sandwich. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> and, and it's perfect time. Yeah. Yesterday was National Fried Chicken Sandwich Day, I think. Oh, so. it was? Go. You know, dang, maybe, I missed out on that. You could sell your <laughs> sell your brood to Popeyes or Chick Fil A or something. <laughs> uh, we did that quite a bit in Teresa's class. You know, the year we had Jeff Lockwood, who was I think one of the instructors yeah. when you were at Story Catcher. He started out as a bug guy at, at the University of Wyoming, and so the book we looked at wasn't about it was locust. You know, and and he looked at how that bug is that the right word bug that insect you know, the locust swarms and all that in the homesteading period of time. And then that's an ecological story about the the uh, the disappearance of the Rocky Mountain locust and all that sort of stuff. And then, so for the class, we, let's talk about eating bugs. So we ate bugs. We ate quite a few bugs that semester, you know. Um, the next year we did ducks, so we raised ducks. So I have a few ducks out in my pasture right now too, little, little ducklings. The mama, she raised, she, she, Set the eggs herself. I didn't incubate them, and and now we have these four little ducklings running around in our pasture as well. So that's it. You know, that's probably stuff that people think English professor probably doesn't. That's probably surprising to know that I'm, I'm spending so much time out with my flock. <laughs> that's Shadron. Well, I, I always equate geese to English faculty, but that's just because of the novel Straight Man. Yeah, by, yes, by, that's by that's Richard that's Russo. <laughs> Well, that's, Matt, that's I, more accurate than you think. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, I think we've gotten to the point of the show where we talk about our quick-hitting questions for you. Okay. So here's the most dangerous one. Um, a favorite book of yours. I hate to ask for the favorite because... You know, I, I, I always come back to Cormac McCarthy. Oh, yeah. I think the book that had the most impact on me was his book, The Road. Um, that's become a bit of cliche, too, but... Um, I, you know, I had a young, my son was about the age of the boy in the, the story at the time, and it really got me thinking about 
I don't know that that's – we did teach that book. We had it in our environmental literature class. It's not clear what happened there, but the world has been devastated and mm-hmm. how, how people have to sort of make their way and, and what that father does to try and protect his son and everything. And knowing about Cormac McCarthy being a much older individual, having this young child and thinking about how this book was kind of a beautiful gift – to this this kid who's probably going to spend most of his life without his father around because you know he's not immortal or anything like right. that. So um, yeah, that's probably the one that's had the most impact on me. Yeah, that's an excellent book. I can remember reading it to my son when he was <laughs> was little. It's yeah. kind of macabre. Yeah. Uh, well, he was only yeah. like one, yeah, so it yeah. was fine. But um, such great metaphors in that yes. book too. And and the way I read it and interpret it, it's open to interpretation. I find it a very hopeful book, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So much of environmental literature, and I read a lot of it now and, and try and teach elements of those and learn with my students about it, it is very dystopian and a little bit hopeless. Um, but even in that extreme circumstance, I think that love kind of triumphs at the end of that. Mm-hmm. That's the way I interpret the yeah. end of that. But Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Matt, what's a hidden talent of yours? Maybe you already exposed this as a yeah, chicken farmer. I don't have farmer. many talents. I think the chicken thing. Um, I have to say that um, I, I like, so, so with the creative writing thing as sort of an adjunct to what I do mostly in my literary space, um, I do try to write. <laughs> Poems, not good poems. And I, I really try, I try, so a secret thing that I don't share with a lot of people is I try, I like to write fiction and um, I don't know if I'm talented at it, but I'm, I'm constantly not letting people read it. <laughs> well, so you're doing it. That, you're doing know. it. That's the important thing. <laughs> it's, it's the exercise of it. Uh, as a college student, what is some advice that you received that has stuck with you? Just don't leave campus ever. <laughs> Maybe that's just for some of us, you know. I always love the idea of of a campus. I don't know what it was. Uh and and so so if you don't have to leave campus, never leave campus. So my daughter just graduated from UNL in three years. And I'm very proud of her. That's great. But like for me, I was on the long-term plan, right? I never wanted to graduate. I wanted to keep taking classes and things like that. I know that's nerdy, um, but I think that if you have more of a... It's hard to do because you can't afford it as much as you used to be able to just sort of swim around in, in, the, in the pool of intellectual sort of um, tides. But um, I, I'd say if, you, you know, make your college years count and, and not, yes, go to some parties and do all that sort of stuff that you do, but, you know, just take classes that you might not otherwise take and experiment and that sort of stuff. The other thing is, um, you know, it is expensive, um, but this was a bit of advice. I think, I don't know if it's good advice or not, but it was advice. When I went to defend my dissertation at Arizona State, I'd go from Shadron, I was in my second year here at Shadron, and, and I flew down to Phoenix, and I met with my dissertation advisor, and we were actually out on a boat. We, he took me out fishing. Um, and uh, we were talking about it. He says, well, you know, you have any regrets or anything? And I said, I'm very much ashamed at how many dollars I owe the government now for my student loans. You know, a huge number by the time I was done with my PhD, the equivalent of a house payment, right? And he looked at me and he said, well, you know, they can't repossess your degree, yeah. you know? And he says, all that stuff you've learned, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Now, that's not good advice for people out there. <laughs> you know, you got to pay your student loans. But I did just finally complete the 10 years of public service, and they just forgave my student loans this last summer, this summer. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. Oh, that yeah. worked out okay. Yeah, absolutely. So go into public service, at least right now, if they don't ruin it, um, you can get your loans forgiven. So that would maybe be good advice. But don't maybe take out so many loans as I do. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, do you have a favorite place on CSC's campus? I used to, believe it or not, I used to love to go up behind campus on the trails. I remember when there weren't any trails, then there were dirt trails, and now there's, there's a lot of it's um, paved. And I would go with my border collie, and we would, I call it jogging, it was more like wogging, but we used to love to sort of run behind campus and all the, all the different seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so I'd say that's probably my favorite place at various times, just being up there and sort of hanging out behind campus. Yeah, but it's still a good spot even after the 2006 yeah. fires. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, what word comes to your mind when you think Shadron State College? Um, okay, outside. Yeah. Can I do my outside spiel? Yeah. Okay, so several years ago, we rebranded ourselves in the English department. Right now, our brand, because we've had this growth in creative writing, um, and we're sort of all following that trend, um, the the theme of our program is now find your story. But several years ago, we came up with this theme that I thought was great. It was called get outside yourself. And I really do think that Shadron State College is a great outside place. You know, it's an outsider as far as people may not think about it as a first choice for a college or whatever. But once you're here, because you're so isolated, frontier and remote and all that sort of stuff, you really can concentrate on your studies, but you can concentrate on social activities, you can concentrate on building community. You really get to know your professors here, I think. And something magical really happens with that cohort of students that come through, and at least in our program, we've, we've really witnessed it. And I, I'm gonna keep doing that thing to sort of um, try and emphasize that outside element, both outside as far as the environmental emphasis, um, an emphasis on nature and things like that, which I think we have in abundance around here, um, but also kind of making yourself an outsider, you know, thinking outside, all the way the outside sort of comes up. I actually have a visual aid, Daniel. You want to see it? Yeah, let's see. Um, this is my, I haven't been able to teach the capstone course in a while, but so this is my capstone course, Get Outside. So we last taught that in fall of 2019. And you can see the listing of readings. We've got Educated by Tara Westover. Um, she grew up in this sort of um, uh, kind of a religious cult. And then she went to college and became educated and all that sort of stuff. So there's an outsider sort of thing. We had Ken L. Gunis's book, Walden on Wheels, where he lived in his van all those years and <laughs> talked about talk about being an outsider. Then we had <laughs> Robert Moore's book on trails, all the way we think about trails. And we had Ted Genoway's book, This Blessed Earth, which follows a, a family a family farm in central Nebraska through four seasons, right? So all these elements of that's where we're at. We we have to interact with the environment around here, I think more than in other, other places in urban spaces. Um, a lot of people will make their living from the earth in various ways. Um, I think the outside is is really important. Um, that's why I've constructed courses like eco composition. That's my that's my writing course for students. They can come in. It has kind of an ecological focus. Or if we do literature of the American West, you'll see that we have these like we have Annie Prue. She's our Wyoming writer, but Jonas Agee, uh, Jonas Agee. She's at UNL, and her book that we read that year, Bones of Paradise, is set in the Sand Hills, right? Um, Pamela Carter-Yorn, um, In Reach, her collection of stories is set basically in, in Bridgeport. So I think all this stuff that we can do to sort of emphasize, here's my, here's my, uh, here's my environmental lit course from a couple of years ago. There's the road, by got the way. Got that. Yep. We've got Jeff Lockwood's book, Prairie Soul, right? So that's kind of a regional sort of appreciating the land. And then you got all the other sort of environmental stuff. Um, and then uh, in the, I have to give a plug to my class in the fall, English 442, Major Writers is the name of the course, but I put a little bit of a parenthesis there, Major Nebraska Writers. We're going to be focusing on Sandoz and Cather, not necessarily as just Western voices, but major literary talent. So that's what we'll be exploring in there with a kind of an emphasis on home. So everything that has us think about getting outside ourselves is what I love is for sort of a theme or an idea. And I have a website. What is it? It's outside yourself, wordpress.com. Com? You we'll put it com? down right here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I bet it's .com. <laughs> All these courses are kind of like that, but outside yourself was the, the term that I, I used for that website. That's where I, I sort of put all my work with environmental humanities and regional studies. So if anybody's interested in exploring more of that, go to that website. It's also where the Storycatcher um, 
storycatcherworkshop.org redirects there. Um, but so that's kind of the that's the word that I love to think about with Shadron is outside. That's a good word. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, certainly fitting. Yeah, even on a hot summer day, I still I want to get outside. Let's yep. get outside. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Matt. Really appreciate you joining us and talking about all the great things that you're doing in the English department, as yeah. well as with the the story catcher in the St. Andrews Society. Yeah, thanks for having me. You can tell I love to talk about myself. So. <laughs> Good to hear. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> all right. <laughs>